Good morning, afternoon and evening everyone. I am Michael Green, I'm the CEO of the Social Progress Imperative and I'm delighted to welcome you to this What Works virtual forum and the launch of the 2020 Social Progress Index. Um, we've got a terrific group of people here for a terrific conversation and lots of crunchy interesting data to be sharing with you. Uh, thank you all for joining us for this launch event. Let me open perhaps with a couple of uh, housekeeping announcements. First of all, we are going to be recording the, uh, the live stream of this, uh, so it'll be able to be available to share uh, and followed and enjoyed again after the event. If you've got a question, um, please use social media to ask that question. Use the hashtag social progress and try and tag at social progress, at SOC progress, the social progress imperative hashtag on that to, uh, to help the conversation going. We'll be monitoring social media uh, so we'll be uh, looking out for your questions and comments and feeding that into the conversation. Socialprogress.org uh, is where they, all the data is. You can explore our interactive detail and dive into all the details of everything we're discussing today right there. Um, before we go any further, let me also uh, make sure I give big thanks to the sponsors and partners who have made this all possible. Um, Deloitte, Amazon Web Services, the Icelandic Prime Minister's Office, the University of Iceland, uh, IQ Business and Catalyst 2030. Uh, and also a special mention to Social Progress Imperatives partner in hosting this, Cognizio. Thank you all very much and thank you all for joining us. So we know that uh, 2020 has been a pretty terrible year and I think we're still trying to figure out what is going to be happening next in the fallout of it. Um, the, we, know, we know that so much is up for grabs though. How we respond to this crisis is going to be decisive. So that's why the Social Progress Imperative, we've created, created the Social Progress Index as a tool to really help inform decision makers in government, in business and civil society to figure out how we can turn the crisis into an opportunity. We're launching the Social Progress Index uh, on the eve of the um, annual first virtual annual gathering of the United Nations and the General Assembly because the sustainable development goals are critical as an agreed plan we have for the future of our world. And we really want to offer the Social Progress Index as a way of tracking progress against those goals. So that's the context and I'm delighted that I have with me Social Progress Imperatives Research Director, Petra Krilova. Petra is probably the most relieved person in the world because this is the, finally the index is out. It's been a product of an enormous amount of hard work between Petra and her co uh, colleague, Jeremy Hamacek, uh, who've been working on this for months on end. Uh, terrific work, Petra. Thank you for all your work on this. Please take us through the uh, Social Progress Index 2020 results. Many thanks, Michael, for the introduction and the opportunity to share the 2020 Social Progress Index results with you all. And thank you for joining us today for this special event. Before I dive into the results, I'd like to ask you to search in your memories and try to remember the year 2011. If you're like me, it might be challenging to even remember where you went on holidays. But you might recall that 2011 was, for some reason, a significant year. Indeed, it was the year when many people took to the streets to advocate for their rights, freedoms, because it was the early days of the Arab Spring. Of the Arab Spring. 10 years ago, the world scored around 60 out of 100 on the Social Progress Index. We measure social progress on a scale of zero to 100, where 100 is the best and zero is the, world, is the worst. The world's performance on personal rights scored a little above its overall progress and people access to information was still somewhat limited. As the Social Progress Index shows, the next 10 years unfolded in remarkable, and I would also say unexpected ways. We have made outstanding progress in improving people's access to information and communication to the extent that it is now more common to have two mobile phone subscriptions instead of one. Most of us, regardless of where we are in the world, can open our smartphones in the morning and have the world news at our fingertips. Most people, not all, we still have some progress to go. But the path of personal rights was different. As we all know, the Arab Spring 
did not bring rights and freedoms to all places. And the rise of populist politics in many countries around the world since then started to put restrictions on our freedoms and life choices. Personal rights alongside inclusiveness are the only two aspects, what we call components of the social progress index, where we are seeing world as a whole decline over the last decade. And so here we are in 2020, another defining year of international politics. The United Kingdom has left the European Union and the United States of America will elect their president for the next four years. Over the last 10 years, the world score improved by 3.61 points. Many of you might think, well, at least we are improving. But you will also wonder whether such progress is going to be enough. Enough to ensure all girls and boys complete free, equitable and quality primary and secondary education. Enough to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and how the catastrophe of climate change and achieve other ambitious targets by 2030. The year by which world leaders have agreed to meet the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. Let me leave you with that question for a moment. We can see the world is performing reasonably well on nutrition, water, shelter, education, as well as access to information and communications due to the gains we have seen in the last 10 years. But we're lagging on safety, health, inclusiveness. And I'm sure it will not come as a surprise to any of us that we're failing on environmental quality. By now, you're most likely suspecting the answer to my previous question is no. We will not meet the SDGs if our rate of progress remains the same, unless we achieve a dramatic step change. Based on the Social Progress Index data over the past 10 years, we estimate that the world will miss the 2030 deadline by 52 years. And the current COVID-19 pandemic could set us back further by 10 years, unless we take action. And we see that taking action is not impossible. And many countries around the world are already leading the way. So there is a speck of hope and also a positive side to the very dark picture I've painted so far. Since 2011, 155 countries, and that's really a majority of all those countries that we measure, have improved by one point or more. Of those 155 countries that improved, 69 countries actually improved by five or more points. And further good news is that most of these countries are low or lower income, where progress is needed the most. Secondly, we also see that developing countries are catching up. By measuring variation in countries' performance, we know that since 2011, countries' performance on social progress has gotten closer. This means that countries are narrowing their inequalities in social outcomes. And we also know that this improvement is higher on social compared with economic performance. And thirdly, we see that some countries are much better in turning their economic means into social outcomes. And this graph demonstrates exactly this. While economic development is closely associated with social progress, we see that for every additional unit of gross domestic product per capita, countries tend to achieve higher social outcomes. There are a lot of countries that achieve stunning social progress performance despite their limited resources. And on the contrary, there are many countries that haven't yet managed to turn their vast economic wealth into appropriate social outcomes for their residents. Let me highlight a few examples here. Kyrgyzstan and Turkey, essentially on par in their performance on social progress at vastly different economic means to achieve those. The superstar of social progress, Costa Rica, achieves remarkably different social progress results compared with Equatorial Guinea 
while having nearly identical gross domestic product per capita. And social progress results on parity those of the United States. I'm also suspecting it will not come as a surprise to many of you to see Norway, joined by Denmark, Finland, Iceland, Australia, New Zealand, alongside others performing at the top. But also notice how clustered these countries are, how close the scores are to one another. The United States, a country many would perhaps expect to be performing much better, is ranked 28th, a few places behind my country of origin, the Czech Republic. At the end of that table, we see the conflict-stricken South Sudan, Chad, and Central African Republic. Let me leave you with a map showing the states of social progress in 2020, where darker colors imply higher progress and lighter green colors, lower progress. Thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you so much, Petra, and congratulations. There's a huge amount of work that goes into this to produce these numbers, and it's all there available on our website for people to look at. Um, there's a huge, rich resource. Our biggest and best social progress index ever, 163 countries and 10 years of data. It's a, it's a fantastic achievement. Thank you. I'm delighted we're also joined today by uh, the eminent member of our advisory board, who's been very active in guiding us, Professor Scott Stern from MIT. Um, Scott, so glad you could join us. Um, and thank you for the, all the work in guiding the Social Progress Index. I just wondered if you wanted to offer a few thoughts and reflections of what you saw from the data this year. Yes, no, first off, uh, thank you to Michael, to the entire SPI team, um, including Petra and Yaramir, who have just done a fantastic job on both push, pushing us on the Social Progress Index and pushing into an even higher level of rigor and potential for impact and insight. So, um, thank you, Michael. Um, you know, the Social Progress Index, I think, as Petra uh, eloquently explained, offers this rigorous approach to measuring non economic societal well being, and it allows us to understand where we stand, where we face challenges. And I know as you're gonna talk about this over the next few hours, what works to allow us to make progress across all citizens. I just wanted to make two observations on this year's index, the 2020 SPI. First, I'm struck by the way that the SPI captures, in a way that I think was somewhat unique, the relative failure of my own country the United States over the past decade to translate its prosperity, its scale into meaningful social progress for all of its citizens. I think we should um, recognize that the social progress index was a bit of a canary in the coal mine well before these issues became manifest through populist politics, through our current reckoning with civil rights, or the very manifest failure of the United States to address COVID-19, the Social Progress Index sheds light on the disconnect in the United States among the G7 in the gap between our economic performance and our social progress. Second, um, I've been fortunate to work with the team, uh, most notably Petra and Yaramir, to start to unpack the interplay, not simply between economic performance and social progress, but the role that each is playing in shaping our response to this current moment, the COVID-19 crisis. We started to look specifically at the potential role that GDP per capita and FSPI have played in the spread and deaths associated with COVID-19. And two striking findings emerge. The first is that in contrast to a perspective in which one of the benefits, in fact, one of maybe the main benefits that you would get from a high level of economic performance is the ability to mitigate the spread of a pandemic, there's actually a positive relationship between GDP per capita and overall COVID-19 case counts. COVID is of course impacting countries at 
every income level and is a continuing crisis. But the key insight is that within the first nine months of this pandemic, we have seen it impact countries at a higher level of measured GDP per capita. There are, of course, important regional differences based on the natural spread of the virus. But once one controls for GDP per capita and those broad regional differences, there then turns out to be a negative and inverse relationship between SPI and COVID cases. In other words, after controlling for GDP per capita and broad region, a higher level of social progress is associated with a lower level of COVID spread. We're still exploring that work. That's why we don't yet have a beautiful slide deck for that. But I just want to highlight that result to reinforce the broader message of what Petra, I think, got to us so quickly, that the Social Progress Index offers insight into how we are actually achieving well-being for all citizens, how we can go and identify those areas where we face challenges, and is in linking ourselves to the SDG goals, how we're going to have to really move things forward in an accelerated way in order to achieve those ambitious goals. Um, once again, I just want to congratulate the team. I look forward to digging into further insights that will arise from these data. And finally, I'm looking forward to seeing the impact that this index will continue to have on understanding how we can improve not simply our economies, but our entire society through the prioritization of social progress. Thank you very much. That's terrific. Thank you so much, Scott. And it's, a, it's an honor and pleasure working with you on this. And I mean, this, this finding, as I said, we, it's, it's early days. It's a tentative finding around the impact of COVID is fascinating, given that in sense, COVID is a manifestation of how a social problem, a health problem, can have enormous economic impact. And maybe it makes us think that if we'd invested a bit differently in our global public health infrastructure over the last decade, we may not be paying such a high economic cost. Now, Petra and Scott have shared a huge, um, a huge amount of uh, thoughts and insights. We're going to, over the course of the next hour and a bit, uh, unpack some of this in some more detail. And what we want to start is looking at this uh, story around sustainable development goals. Um, the target is for a step change in the real quality of life for people around the world and the sustainability of our planet within just one more decade, 2030. Our data says on current trends, 2082 is we'll be lucky. And if COVID has a negative effects, we fear it could be another, another decade. I spoke uh, earlier with uh, Amina Mohammed, who's the Deputy Secretary General of the United Nations, who has the responsibility for driving this agenda, and asked her for her reflections on what she thinks needs to happen to turn around the SDG agenda. Um, Deputy Secretary General, Amina, welcome to the <laughs> What Works Forum. Uh, it's great to have you with us. Um, and it's at a very critical time. You know, Social Progress Index data is showing that you know, the SDGs are hugely ambitious. There was a long way to go even before the COVID crisis. And now COVID has hit. And that's going to have an impact on our economies, on equality, on a whole range of different ways beyond our health impacts. So how are you seeing the, what, what does COVID mean for the SDGs? And I think especially at times like this, we need to be opt optimistic. So particularly, where's the opportunity in this crisis to do something, do things better? Yeah, I, I think first of all, to acknowledge the crisis and that it's a human one, um, but it, ha it needs a global response. And that what you had said earlier, Michael, um, which is uh, we were already not on track as we um, you know, took stock last year. So COVID has exacerbated it. And for a, for a moment there, everybody thought it would put a pause um, on uh, the SDGs, but we've taken a different tack to say that no, actually it provides much more of an opportunity. First, that we recognize beyond the health crisis that we now had a socioeconomic one. The prescription had side effects and those side effects in some countries got there before COVID. Um, and, and it was really sort of an, an impetus that I think focused governments on people that were least likely to be reached and vulnerability took on a new meaning. Everybody suddenly became vulnerable. Um, and so the attention of government to services, uh, the attention to try to keep stability because they knew that an informal economy in many of our developing countries was what was the glue that kept the nation together. 
and suddenly it wasn't there anymore. Um, and so uh, again, we, so we first thing we got was the attention of government and the attention of government, not just to health, but the socioeconomic piece, that it wasn't a choice between do the health and do the economics, we do the lot. And that sort of brought to the fore. So what is the North Star? How do we frame all of this? Well, you know, you've got the SDGs and they already do frame what we need to do. What you need to do is to, you know, really anchor whatever response you have in your stimulus packages or how you respond in that. And, and this is happening on different levels. Our socioeconomic framework uh, talks about, yes, um, trying to get control of COVID and suppress that, but it also says we need the health system strengthened while we're doing that because a lot of what we're asking for in basic services for, for health and well-being and education and water and sanitation has to continue. Um, and then we are speaking to the, the resilience piece because at the community level, um, one wants to see how we engage with the informal sector, how we engage with women, with young people, uh, jobs that are disappearing because overnight they're locked down. How do we bring them back? Uh, how do we use technology here now to leapfrog uh, where we didn't have it before? Energy transitions, um, uh, where solar power perhaps would have gone a little slower because we wouldn't have had the impetus to do it. Um, so we're finding lots of hooks in the framework um, to respond to COVID um, and hopefully we won't have the same reading. I mean, clearly the, 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 the um, recessions here um, across the world, uh, we do need a response um, economically um, if we don't want to go into a depression. Um, but we think there's a lot of fodder there for us to do this. Um, and, and let me just end by saying the climate agenda is a really important one and we don't have to add it on. It is an opportunity that we can take as we're growing these economies more inclusively and looking at inequalities and poverty. We can say this is where we can green our economies. Uh, this is where we can create the green jobs. Um, and this is where we can really move at the scale at which um, we need. So we are optimistic. We think the resources are there, but it's got to be um, a joining up of, of, of responsibilities and, and, and energies and partnerships to make it happen. Yeah, I mean, it's really striking the way this crisis has made real things we've known in the past, the sense that, you know, to be resilient societies, to deal with threats like this, we need to have inclusive human-centered development, you know, access to water and sanitation for all, education, all those kind of things. But as you say, it's made it real for people in a new way that hopefully will give a, a new energy. So what do you think, I mean, is the sort of the policy and financing agenda moving forward? Uh, I mean, right at the very beginning, uh, just as uh, the G20 and our IFIs were meeting to, um, to decide what sort of global response they were going to have to this, um, the Secretary General had said, look, that we've got the resources, but what we need to make sure is that that response um, is everyone gets an opportunity to do it. Uh, coming out of those meetings, yes, we did see some uh, support um, that went to countries uh, to try to deal with their debt, to try to deal with the fiscal gaps that they had insufficient completely um, and too slow uh, and, and, and therefore the reasons why they couldn't do it and not the reasons how we could make it happen and bring the solution. So we very quickly harvested this sort of inertia um, and put that to work um, in a financing framework um, that looked at six issues which we believed um, everyone was looking at but just not moving the ambition or the response to it and, and had heads of state meet with that. So we think that what we do have is a hook on the debt situation where we will continue to push for the moratorium. When we spoke about it a few months ago and, and said, you know, minimum two years, everybody screamed. And now everybody says, well, we agree with the two years. Actually, we need more. Um, but it needs to be tailor-made. There's no cookie cutter in this because people are being affected in different ways. Um, and so that's one big part. The other big part of it is that it's a little bit of a catch-22. You're having countries who are going for debt relief or at least um, to, to, uh, to, to, to restructure them. Um, and then they're getting hit on the other side where their credit ratings are going and they don't have access to markets. And we've got to find a way um, to change uh, how that is happening and not just to go by the category of a country, but by the vulnerability of what is happening now in the, in, in the time of COVID. Um, and then not to forget that, you know, we have to bring private creditors on, on board. This is not just about the public sector. Um, there are opportunities um, on the sustainability agenda, as I said earlier, how do we grow back green? Um, it's, it's yes, growing back better is great, but we've got to be very specific to what that means and define it better. Um, it is a lot of the things that you've said. I mean, they're, they're not rocket science, but getting them done 
um, one can have that discussion now with government and incentivize the spending that way. Well, you mentioned that critical role of the, the private capital markets. In the sense, the COVID crisis is a manifestation of how non-economic risks can have huge economic impacts. So hopefully in some ways this is going to shift perceptions of investors. And it does seem that there's a, a growing interest in uh, sustainable investing, ESG investing on the back of this, but also in the kind of green finance agenda. Are you optimistic that we can see an, an interest in the green and wider ESG financing area from the private capital markets? I think we are. We're very, um, we're very enthusiastic. Well, we're encouraged because um, um, with uh, our envoy, Mark Carney, what he's been able to do is to bring the transparency agenda to the fore. So not just say it, but actually open up your books to exactly what it is you're doing. You could be investing green here and you could be investing brown there and that could totally wipes out what you're doing. Um, and I think that we're seeing many more companies now um, open to that. It's not something you force, it's voluntary um, and more are leaning that way. And they're leaning that way because I think they, they see the hook in the climate action agenda and in the SDGs. Uh, so it becomes a little bit more tangible um, and it's not a feel good. It actually is good for the bottom line um, and it changes. And I think one thing that COVID has done to all of us is that we suddenly realize that with the pause, many things have shown us how um, we don't necessarily need everything that we've talked about. Um, the needs and wants conversation um, on consumption um, and therefore what we have to produce, which makes it un un unsustainable, is one that young people are having right now um, because they've seen it. They've seen the, the, the benefits of actually putting a pause on um, a, a lot of what um, we've done with pollution. So I think, um, I think the green agenda can work. I, it, it is showing jobs. It is showing how technology can connect people better. I think it's underpinning a new narrative um, for what I would say is global um, cooperation. I mean, I, it's, it's international cooperation, it's multilateralism, and all these words, um, everyone sees the pushback. I think it's normal to expect a country in a crisis like this to take responsibility for its own. It's almost as though when you get on an aircraft, everyone says, when, when you have to put your oxygen mask, deal with yourself first and then help others because you're no good, you're not there, right? Um, okay, I think everyone who, who is able to help others has got their oxygen mask on. Trillions have gone into um, stimulus packages in developed countries. And now's the time to really appreciate that you need to fund the vaccines, you need to fund the fiscal deficits to keep economies going. Um, and it, it, it's good for you, but it's also good for the global um, community um, and you will thrive on that um, uh, and, and I think you know so that isolation nationalism um, we have to sort of uh, show the implications of it but not in a way that is negative um, I think in a way that you feel that it's better for you uh, to, 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 to change that around and to begin to invest in it. Well, everything about the global political community of course coming up is uh, the UN General Assembly meeting perhaps the one of, uh, on its 75th birthday a very strange one without the usual events, perhaps New Yorkers will be grateful for that. Um, but what do you see as being the agenda then for the General Assembly this year to try and drive these conversations forward? Well, I think the first thing that we, um, we as a global community should take credit for is that, you know, the UN didn't close for business. The business continuity plan was really big for us to say that we're still out there doing our humanitarian work, even more so on the front lines for the healthcare workers. Um, we still are there trying to resolve crises in conflict and with peace because that goes on. Um, but we're also there to, um, to, to further the 2030 agenda. So the GA this year um, was always going to be pretty exciting. We were going to begin the decade, the countdown to the 2030 agenda. We were going to review at 75, then what or so what um, uh, for multilateralism. Um, and then we had a couple of what we, what we think are, are really important meetings, um, one on the Beijing plus 25, um, and then um, discussing biodiversity at a summit level. These will all see it still happen. They'll happen in a virtual space, um, and that's difficult to manage. But as you see now, um, we are connecting so many more people than we've ever done before, and the feedback that we're getting has helped us to push things at the country level. Um, so we will begin by opening up what we call the stretch week, um, because it will go over just over um, a week and a half, uh, two weeks, um, and we'll begin that with a decade. That will be the curtain raiser to tell people exactly where we are. You'll be interested because um, the indices that we will use is not just to put the data out there globally, regionally, but to ask what the implications are 
with a lens on climate, on poverty and inequality, and on gender. I mean, for me, what is important about the UN at 75 is the generational transition that must happen. 1945 must move into the future with young people, with technology, with the cities that we will live in. So it, it, it must be forward leaning, it must imagine beyond imagination. Um, and and that's, the, that's the direction I'd like to think that we, you know, 75 would go. Yeah, it's in, as you said, in a sense like the COVID crisis, the, the uh, hunger itself is an opportunity to do things differently and build out to a new generation and really kind of mobilize that coalition to getting behind the SDGs and achieving the progress that we know is possible. You know, the solutions are out there. It's really about accelerating and driving those. Social Progress Index has been running for a number of, number of years, trying to promote inclusive and sustainable people-centered development around the world. Obviously, therefore, you know, supporting the SDGs is a key part of our agenda. And one of the things we've tried to do with the Social Progress Index is use it as a tool to you know, track how we're doing against the SDGs and tell the SDG story and advocate for the SDGs. It's a very interesting index, very interesting. It pushes, it pushes uh, the questions in a different direction. Um, and I've always said to everyone, you need to interrogate this from different uh, perspectives because it is an agenda um, that is so much more inclusive and it's not just dealing with a piece of development, it's dealing with the whole of it. That's right. That's only yeah. whole holistic. I think one of the great risks yeah. is SDG a la carte, where we just pick off bits and bobs and yeah. the yeah. whole package. Mm -hmm. Amina, thank you so much for joining us at What Works. Um, our best wishes for a really successful General Assembly meeting. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And, you know, for What Works, just, just keep, you know, I think believing people do work, given the right um, atmosphere, the right table, the right um, environment. People work and they work for themselves, they work for humanity and they work for the planet. Fantastic Thanks. closing message, Amina, thank you so much. You're welcome, thank you. Bye. That was uh, Amina Mohammed, someone who has certainly got their hands full at the moment with a very big agenda. Um, now, if we're going to move forward on this, uh, on doing things differently, are the people of the world on board for that? Do they want to see a different way of doing things that prioritizes people and planet? Well, with our friends in Ipsos, uh, we did some polling and we asked, and I think we can share with you now. Um, so we asked people, thinking about the current situation with COVID-19, which should your country prioritize more, health and well-being or economic growth? Well, in the middle of the crisis, seven out of 10 people said it's health and well-being that matters. But what happens when the current crisis has passed? Imagine when COVID-19 is over, what should your country prioritize? And strikingly, even then, only over half of the people were saying, even after the crisis over, the social has got to be prioritized. I'll leave you there. We'll, uh, we can look at that results. We'll share information about that polling from, uh, from Ipsos uh, online as well. Now, um, moving towards action, I think one of the things we discussed with Amina was the fact that, you know, so many of these problems actually are achievable. There are pioneers who are already delivering on uh, social progress and progress towards the SDGs. What we want to do in this next section is just recognize some countries that really have been social progress champions. And one of those is Iceland. Iceland has an extraordinary record in, in on environmental sustainability, on gender equity, and a whole host of other areas. And indeed, uh, a few months ago, there was analysis done looking at how it seems to be women-led countries that are doing best uh, using in responding to the COVID crisis. And obviously, Iceland is one of them, and uh, we were delighted that SBI data was used to reach that conclusion. So, Jalati, we, uh, we got a message here from the Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrin Johnstottir, who has blazed a path in tackling the, the uh, COVID crisis, uh, and also is very forward-looking on the future challenges around environmental sustainability and the equity agenda. Here's a message from the Prime Minister of Iceland. Dear guests, it's an honor to speak to you today at this strange time when meeting in person is impossible. I am thrilled to share this virtual stage with such a phenomenal group of speakers, all leaders and experts in their respective fields, so that together we may discuss the significant challenges our world faces today in advancing social progress. The COVID-19 pandemic has warped the world at such a pace, it seems we may only fully comprehend its scale once enough time has passed to give us the benefit of hindsight. Then we will begin our journey back to normal. 
The question to contemplate now is, what do we want that normal to be? In his new book, The Time and Water, the Icelandic author Andri Snær Magnason paints us a picture of the speed of changes that the climate crisis will bring about in the next 100 years. The melting of glaciers, rising sea levels, floods, droughts. The acidity levels of the Earth's ocean will change more than they have during the last 50 million years. All of this will happen during the lifetime of a child that is born today. Andri Snær Magnusson writes, Changes that hitherto happened over hundreds of thousands of years now happen over a hundred years. Such speed is mythological and touches all life on Earth and the foundation of everything we think, choose, produce and believe. This has resonated strongly with me as I contemplate the new normal. In economics, mainstream thinking has been to focus on and measure ourselves by growth, by GDP. Economics is still centered on the measurable and quantifiable. Growth is considered not only essential, but unequivocally positive, regardless of how it is achieved and at what cost. Surely the monumental changes that face us will push us to new ways of thinking, to new beliefs about growth and successful societies. Another accelerator that challenges conventional thinking is the COVID-19 pandemic. During the last few months, it has mercilessly reminded us of the cost at which growth has been achieved as it disproportionately impacts the poor and the vulnerable, precisely those who have been left behind in the world's narrow focus on achieving unsustainable growth. I am not going to recite to you the statistics that tell us where we have gone wrong, whether in growing inequality or in lack of care for our planet. You wouldn't be here today if you did not already have some idea. I would however like to mention this. The IMF predicts that rich countries will borrow 17% of their combined GDP this year to fund 4.2 trillion US dollars in spending and tax cuts designed to keep the economy going. That is a staggering amount of money being spent at a global scale. And one of the biggest challenges the world's leaders face right now is putting these funds to work in a sustainable way to serve our societies and our planet collectively for a better and more equitable future. The United Nations have called this pandemic an unprecedented wake-up call and an opportunity to do things right for the future. This cannot be understated. The pandemic has, in fact, laid bare deep inequalities and exposed precisely the failures that are addressed in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. Our opportunity is the fact that we already have done the hard work of creating our shared sustainable development goals. They are now more important than ever and the path to achieve them must be marked with measurements that determine our progress against the metrics that matter. The Social Progress Index we are here to discuss today is one great example of such measurements. Iceland's rank on the SPI list for this year is 9. We are proud of what we have achieved, but also fully aware of our weaknesses. We not only have areas to improve upon, but we also have ones we must carefully protect as we work our way out of the current economic collapse. One of the ways we are choosing to do both is to not only focus on external metrics such as the SPI index, but to supplement them with our own internal metrics. With the support of a group called the Wellbeing Economy Governments Project, my government has developed 39 indicators that include economic, environmental and social factors to track our well-being progress. Based on these indicators, we have determined the areas where we most need to improve. These are now our well-being priorities and they will guide the five-year fiscal strategy we'll put forward this October in order to help us make sure we don't lose sight of what really matters. 
Dear guests, the COVID-19 pandemic is spreading human suffering, destabilizing the global economy and upending the lives of billions of people across our planet. As we work our way out of the pandemic, we have an opportunity to do things right for the future. Let us be humble and brave enough to do so. Thank you. That was Catherine Jakobs, the, uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Iceland, bringing us insights on social progress as well as Icelandic literature. Um, now, moving on to our next set of the conversation, I'm delighted that we're joined by Gillian Tett, who is the uh, Chair of the Editorial Board and Editor-at-Large editor at, at the FT. Gillian, uh, welcome to the conversation. Uh, lovely to have you here, and I think you might still be muted. Um, now, uh, some people uh, might, in an old world, say, Financial Times, what's the Financial Times doing at an event about social progress and the SDGs? Um, tell us about how the sustainability agenda is, fits with uh, the FT's agenda going forward. And we're still not hearing you. I, um, That's it, we'll do your, you're back, you're here. Okay, how is that now? Perfect. Great, okay, fantastic. Sorry about that. Um, I will take off my microphone. Can you hear me now still? Not as well. Okay, we are definitely in a world where we're all having to improvise <laughs> a lot. Anyway, anyway, great to talk to you. Um, yeah, let me tell you about why we care about this, which is that, you know, a newspaper like the Financial Times has, as the name suggested, covered finance and markets and business and economics for years. Um, we used to assume that a lot of the social issues were a bit soft and hippy-dippy and irrelevant, but starting just over a year ago, we launched a new um, platform and a website called Moral Money, if any of you haven't seen it, which is trying to look at these questions of social progress, um, environmental change, governance um, within a hard-headed financial business and economic prism. So we're looking at environmental social governance issues, the SDGs, questions like that. And so we launched this platform, Moral Money, just over a year ago. And I'm delighted to say it's revealed very, very strong interest on the part of FT readers in these issues. And even more delighted to say that although some of us, including myself, wondered whether COVID-19 might actually slow down the level of interest in these issues. In fact, quite the reverse has happened. So it's a very interesting moment in history. And so it seems to be reflected in that polling that almost the crisis has accelerated the amount of interest in these areas. So you've, uh, we've given you a bit of a preview of the Social Progress Index results. Were there any issues that struck you coming out? Well, I should say very quickly, before I talk about the Social Progress Index, um, one of the things that has really changed in the last year is that ESG and to a certain degree the SDGs um, have moved from being a tool of social activism alone into being an area of risk management as far as most big businesses and financiers are concerned because the tipping point that's really happened in the last year and what we're tapping into is this idea that actually if you ignore these issues it could actually end up costing you or to put it another way people are looking at this not just because they want to do good for the world or change the world they also want to do good for themselves and that's a very important tipping point. Um, and that really plays into the SPI, um, the Social Progress Index, because one of the things I find very striking is this correlation that's got highlighted between the countries which actually have done better in social progress relative to GDP and their preparedness for the COVID-19 pandemic, or conversely, the failure of rich countries to actually have the tools they needed and systems they needed to cope with the pandemic which has ended up being incredibly costly for countries. It would have been far cheaper to invest in healthcare in a more equitable fashion earlier on. And the second point I find also fascinating is the sharp disjunction between the pattern for access to information and a world where more people have two mobile phone or cell phone accounts than just one and the deterioration in the level of personal rights. And to me, that is a recipe for political protest, if not social explosion, further down the road, which again is something that anyone who cares 
about having a stable enough climate to do business and finance should really pay attention to because you can say the fact that people are looking at ESG and the SDG issues out of self-preservation to ensure, avoid doing harm to themselves um, is just an example of people being very hypocritical and not really caring about the genuine spirit behind these goals. Or you can say, whenever a revolution happens anywhere in the world, it's not usually because of a tiny group of activists, it's because the silent majority feels that it's actually easier to go along with the shift. And I think that really is a tipping point that's happened in the world of ESG in the last year that we at the Financial Times with our platform Moral Money have tapped into. But it's also a tipping point that could actually reshape the debate at the UN and elsewhere as we go into the all important UN General Assembly meetings. I mean, one thing that we did very clearly when we built the Social Progress Index was to factor in some of these issues around rights and inclusiveness and freedoms, etc., which often get a bit undermeasured. Um, and it's been very interesting how we found that, you know, first of all, this relationship we seem to see between social progress and resilience to COVID, it's particularly strong for those issues, that actually having rights and freedoms is associated with that. And we also have seen some of our analysis as well, that that dimension has a very strong relationship with life satisfaction. And that actually, for your, to keep your population happy, it's not just bread they need, it's actually freedom as well. Yeah, I mean, it really, you know, it depends on the old cliche about whether you're in this for a, as part of a marathon or a sprint and countries which focus on the marathon aspect tend to do better, as do companies. Um, or another way of framing it, an image I often use, is that we've gone from a world which is basically about tunnel vision, where essentially investors and businesses and often governments just focused on very narrow indices like GDP or um, return on assets or return on equity or profits or shareholder returns into a world where people are increasingly taking a lateral vision and trying to put problems and the consequences of what they do within a wider context. And that's another way of saying that actually it's not just about economics, but as the Atlantic Prime Minister said, it's also about the social factor. Well, if, uh, if investors start taking a lateral view in the wider picture, uh, a country that should benefit is uh, Costa Rica, which has been consistently a champion in social progress, particularly relative to its GDP. In this year's index, I think uh, Costa Rica ranks about 58th in terms of uh, GDP per capita, but 37th in terms of social progress, and is also very strong on some of those opportunity issues. And we're delighted that uh, the president of Costa Rica, uh, Carlos Alvarado, is here to join us. Mr. President, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and sharing, I think, the success that Costa Rica's had in driving social progress and also in, in responding to, the, to this COVID crisis where out Costa Rica's outperformed many of its neighbours. Um, so, pr President, welcome. Gillian, I think you're going to lead this section of the conversation. So yeah, absolutely. Um, good morning, President. I'm just checking that I can see you. Um, Fantastic. Well, thank you very much indeed, President Alvarado. Um, great to talk to you and great to see that you're wearing your mask. I think that is also a sign of social cohesion and good civic duty at a time when mask wearing has come to symbolize both and have value, not just for medical reasons. Well, thank you, Gillian and Michael. It's a real pleasure to join you. And yes, actually, I have to wear a mask to follow uh, national regulation. <laughs> we just enforce uh, that uh, we need to wear them indoors, outdoors, and everywhere to protect ourselves. But it's a pleasure to be here with you. Right. Well, I wish there were more parts of America that also took that so totally to heart. But um, first question I'd like to ask you was, um, how have you formulated policy in recent months? Have you been focusing primarily on the economic issues or have you been given equal weight to the social issues as well? Well, I do believe uh, we need to, to work uh, both sides of the equation. There is no way that you can just focus on the economic part or on uh, the sanitary, the health part. That's uh, when one frames that in, one, in that way at the moment of delivering social policy or, or economic policy, uh, you might have a false dilemma that they, they tend to, to contrast each other, but it, they are not. What we are facing now is that we have the, the health problem, 
which we are containing with social security uh, somehow successfully, but that's, that's, still, um, that's still, well, months to come until we have a solution. But then the most uh, pressing issue becomes unemployment. So there's lots of uh, necessity from people, especially from the informal market and informal labor to go out to work. So the strategy we've developed is we need to take care of ourselves. We need to work and take care of ourselves. In a country like Costa Rica, we don't have enough savings or enough uh, uh, fiscal space in order to tell people, okay, you stay back home and we're going to pay you to be there until this is over. We cannot do that in most developing countries or poor countries. So then we need to put the responsibility on the liberty of everyone to do the right thing, to take the right choice, and that is to wear the mask, to wash your hands, to keep the social distance, um, not to have uh, gatherings or parties, to protect ourselves. And that's the way you can both protect your, the works, the jobs, and you can protect the health. So um, it's, a, it's quite complicated moment on that because Costa Rica needs to protect its population and also needs people working in order to both protect health in a more comprehensive way. Health is not only about a matter of not being ill, it's about mental health and it's about income in the households. So, for example, how easy is it to get um, cheap masks for the population in Costa Rica right now? Well, more and more, it's been more accessible. I mean, the prices have been coming down in order to, to, to get the mask, and people are, are producing their own uh, masks. There are guidelines to do that. Also, uh, well, companies have been giving those to their workers. You can see those on, on the streets, uh, on the public service. Public servants have their equipment. So it's, uh, it's accessible, but yet still it's uh, how to wear it properly. You will still get seeing people not covering their nose with the mask or having them basically on their neck, uh, but they are accessible. Um, but I, I, if I may, Gillian, I wanted to point out something that you mentioned about the sprint and the marathon related to the GDP and the social progress, because there was something that I wanted to measure uh, and to, t to say. When one is in government, one tends to administrate the legacy of previous generations. And we are administrating both the good things and the bad things. In the good part, we are administrating a national universal healthcare system that's protecting us. But that was a legacy of decades ago. And when people created that, they were not thinking exclusively about GDP. They were thinking about uh, human welfare. But that has proven to trigger not only our social progress index, but our GDP as well. Let me put an example that's not necessarily the good one. We, our development is also based on universal education. And that's good, but the, the pandemic uh, has shown that we have a weak system in education, for example, on digital. So we have half of our students with connection and equipment, but half of them lacking either connection or the computers. And we were meant to do that 10 years ago as a country, and we did not manage to do that. So what I'm saying here is, one, when in a democracy, when you are in power, you administrate somebody else's legacies, both in their rights and their wrongs. And when one is in power, one has to build the legacies for the future to come. But when you come to think about democracy and GDP, it's very present focused. People want results now. People want to see the jobs now. That's why sometimes the discussion on climate change or on SDGs becomes complex because you're building legacies for the future to make it sustainable, sustainable growth as a marathon. So one of the pressing issues for democracies now 
is how you deliver in the present while at the same time you build the legacies for the future in terms of decarbonization, in terms of green jobs, in terms of inclusiveness, in inclusive education, human rights. I think one of the, that's one of the most pressing dilemmas to, to current democratic leaders. That's fascinating. Um, I'm curious, by the way, I should say, if anyone's watching and wants to ask a, a question to President Alvarado, um, do type that into Zoom and I'll pick it up into the chat function. I'll try and pick it up if we can. Um, I'm curious, you know, in order to communicate good messages about healthcare to the population, you need to have a population that kind of believes what you're saying and has access to good information. Um, and that's even more true if you're trying to communicate a longer term political agenda about future actions and future investments. I'm curious, um, how are you coping with the information ecosystem in Costa Rica? Um, is there a lot of fake news going around and do people trust what you or any of your government would actually say? Well, uh, the credibility on the health system is very high. I mean, people do believe a lot on our social security. It's pretty similar to the NHS in the UK. I mean, it lags to the 1940s of the last century. So it's a, there's a strong credibility on, on the social security institution and also on the, on the Ministry of Health. So the people that are the, the carry the, vo the official voice of government through uh, the sanitary and the health institutions, they have a high credibility. So people uh, tend to follow their instructions. Also, Costa Rica has a record of vaccination and people don't hesitate uh, in the topics of uh, vaccines. Yes, there is lots of fake news going around of uh, false uh, treatments, uh, that people might care, but that, that they can be harmful instead for their health. Uh, but I believe the, the, there's, there's quite a struggle on information that I, in that area, I believe we are winning in front of the population. But yes, it's true that fake news and conspiracy theories are, are uh, all around them. And also, it's, uh, there's some backing up on science progresses. For example, in Costa Rica, uh, the University of Costa Rica developed a treatment of, uh, on, based on plasma. It's plasma from blood from people that were ill and recovered. So they take the, um, uh, the, the immunity system they develop, they grew those in horses, and they take back that blood and put it into new patients. And that's proven to work. So people are backing up the, the science behind of uh, what we are doing. Um, but yet it's, it's true that there are also false treatments and, and many people going around with uh, conspiracy theories and that, um, that can be yes, a, a threat as well. Right, right. One question before I turn to a couple of great questions we're getting in from the audience. Um, Costa Rica has been traditionally classed as a middle income country. Um, and even before COVID hit, there was questions about access to financing on the international markets um, because you neither qualify for UN World Bank money, nor do you necessarily always have the support from international investors in the global capital markets. So I'm curious, given that we're already seeing signs of a potential emerging market financial, if not crisis, then stress in places like Indonesia, are you concerned that something that's going to challenge you in the coming months will be another global financial markets um, round of volatility that could hurt your financing options? Um, and if so, how will you respond and how might that change your um, internal programs? Well, Gillian, that's a great question. Uh, on 2018, we had to enforce a fiscal reform in Costa Rica to protect our, our finances. And we were in the process of recovering, uh, but then COVID came along. Currently, we are working a uh, agreement with the International Monetary Fund for our finance for the years to come in a program 
to make our uh, finances uh, stable. But this is going to be all around the globe happening. There are more than 80 countries around the world that have reached out to the IMF in order to, to, to have solutions. So, and we're going to be launching an initiative in the, in the UN General Assembly in that week. It's called FACE, but because the key message is what Europe has done for its community, we need to do all around the world. We need a program for the whole globe to finance in long-term finance with, uh, with low interest rate and fixed interest rate. I mean, if LIBOR is today at 0.7, I believe, that has to be fixed so we can lend money to responsible, transparent uh, 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 governments that are committed to uh, fighting corruption to protect their populations, to protect their entrepreneurs, and to protect their growth. And I believe the one thing that you mentioned uh, previously is uh, it's also an element key here. We have to do this because of solidarity of human solidarity, because there's going to be people suffering all across the globe. But also, we need to do this in self-interest, particularly the most uh, rich and developed countries. Why? Because if the world's economy, if the globe's economy and the societies are not doing well, it's going to be a less safe world for all to live in. I mean, if people do not have opportunity, those means uh, more illegal markets, more drug trafficking, more migration, less foreign investment, and less growth of emerging markets to buy relevant technology or products from the developed world. So we need to do this initiative both for altruistic means, but also for self-interest of all of the countries. So we're proposing to build a fund with uh, the countries that uh, produce 80% of the global GDP to create a fund to, to lend that money uh, to the developing countries, emerging markets and poor markets of countries uh, in a proportion of 3% of their GDP to help that, them recover. But isn't that, we mean, help them recover after COVID or isn't that what the IMF and World Bank do already? Yes, but I do believe that that's not necessarily going to be enough. I oh, mean, right. the, w what the World Bank and IMF are doing now, we're working in terms of uh, lending money in in uh, shorter terms. We're talking here about long-term, 50 years, cheap uh, credit, but to give, a, to give a relief to the countries. I mean, if you can, many economies uh, depend, for example, on tourism, on the tourism industry. I think about the Caribbean, for example, uh, but also Turkey or, uh, countries like that, that depend a lot on tourism. Tourism has now come to zero. And it's a very sustainable industry that gives, uh, provides for many around the world. Well, we need to provide relief in terms of the recovery of that. It's said that tourism is going to take years to go back to the levels it was on January, 2020. Yes. So I do believe that uh, it's, a, it's a moment in which solidarity and self-interest are on the same side of the, of the equation. And it's a great moment for also to, to, to use multilateralism to make this happen and to gather right. people around to, to make this work. Right. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, Mr. Avarado, how do you think the 2020 FBI results can help you drive post-COVID policies? Well, uh, this is going to take a, a while. And 
there are many fronts at the same time. Uh, I think in democracies, we need to educate ourselves to operate in cl complex scenarios. And that's the problem with populism. Populism do not work in complex scenarios. It's either black or white. Uh, and this complex scenario has lots of variables and we need to, to address those. In the immediate term, we need to protect people, protect jobs, protect social cohesion in order to reach 2021 and to have the vaccine be available as quick as possible for everyone. For that also, we need finance to buy those vaccines. At the same yes. time, we need to uh, enforce the programs uh, with IMF and others to have a, a trajectory of our uh, macroeconomics that, um, that gives confidence to the markets and proves our commitment with stability and responsibility. So that's what we are working on another, uh, let's call it a, another lane of this, uh, of this situation. At the same time, we need to work and we're working very hard with social programs to protect the most vulnerable, also not to lose human capital and, um, and also human dignity throughout this period. And that means uh, cash transfers to people that need it, uh, food to people that uh, those most vulnerable that have lost their jobs. Um, and also at the same time, we need to build a future. We need to keep in track, for example, in policies of decarbonization and protecting biodiversity. We cannot renounce to that because that, that's the future we need to protect as well. We need to keep working on, for example, uh, inclusive education because pandemics proven that we have education, universal education, but not digital education for everybody. So we need to build in also that legacy. And when you're working in many of those uh, fields at the same time, people say, no, stop. What matters is jobs now. The rest is, uh, it's a waste of time. But the true thing is in 10 years, in 20 years, people are going to say, why, gov why the people that were in government 20 years ago uh, did not uh, address this, this pressing topic. Right. So I think that the, the responsible way to go in democracies is, as we say in Costa Rica, you have to walk and chew gum at the same time. <laughs> well, that's a very good way of putting it. Um, question, I mean, we're almost out of time, but I get the question here. Um, Costa Rica has the S best SPI in Latin America. Um, what is the main cause for that? You know, what is your secret? Well, I think it also has to do with a strong legacy on healthcare, uh, universal healthcare developed about 80 years ago. Also that we abolished the army. So we do not have armed forces whatsoever. And we devoted those resources to education and health. Uh, also, we develop a strong uh, system of national park and conservation areas that manage us to recover many of our, of our forests and protected areas. And that, instead of harming the economy, uh, triggered, triggered growth because we develop a very robust ecotourism industry that's a clean industry and provides lots of... of uh, well, of, of income to the country. And also we develop a, um, we diversify our economy and currently our main export is uh, medical devices. So we are uh, targeting on human talent for our growth. We will never compete in scale. Costa Rica is a 5 million country uh, population, but we can compete in quality. So, uh, we are targeting to have high level talent in order to compete. And, and I believe those are the, the main, the, the, the building blocks for that su success. But we need to today build our future success. We cannot stay there. 
And our future success means on building uh, that inclusive education for everyone. That means every Costa Rican has to be bilingual by 2040. That means that every Costa Rican has either from public private school in any corner of the country has to have digital education. And in building that human quality, we need to address one of our main uh, problems, that's inequality. We have a high level of inequality because we have high standards on one part of the population, highly educated, very well income, but there are still lots of informality and, and low salaries in other parts of the population. So we need to level the, the playing field, mostly with healthcare, education, and opportunities. That's one of our main challenges today. And that's why we need to surpass this pandemic and well, build back better. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, listen, that's been incredibly interesting. Um, we're getting a round of virtual applause from the audience on the Zoom chat function. And I just wanted to say thank you for spending the time, for giving us your examples. Best of luck in not just forging um, you know, decent policies in the coming months, but also trying to prompt the wider UN community into looking at new financing options. As you say, the question of what kind of finance is going to be available for the emerging market countries in the coming months is going to be very interesting indeed to watch. Um, so I'm now going to hand back to Michael Green and say um, what a pleasure it has been to talking um, this morning. And over to you, Michael. Brilliant. Thank you so much, President Alvarado. Thank you again so much for joining us. And I think Costa Rica's example is so important because our world can so easily fall into pessimism. And I think cases like Costa Rica, where you can demonstrate how a country has been able to deliver over a long a period of time, a period of decades, as you said, for its people is incredibly important to show that it is possible. I know there are many challenges ahead, and uh, but we wish you all the best with that work and uh, any way we can support, we would gladly do so. Thank you, President. Um, Thank you very much, Michael. And uh, it was great for Gillian for joining us. And I think this conversation around financing is so important. As Gillian said, there's uh, questions about the financing of, um, uh, of emerging markets. But in a sense, if we're, if we're seeing a change, investors more interested in the, uh, in the SDGs, and perhaps if we can demonstrate that social metrics tell you something meaningful about a country's economic sustainability, then maybe we'll see investors changing their perspective and see more private financing for the SDGs. Now, one of the things that Amina Mohammed touched upon was the, uh, the handing over the, of the baton, the next generation taking over. And as uh, Pres President Alvarado talked about, you know, this is, you know, the policy decisions have long legacies. So we're going to move the conversation on a bit now and think about young people, uh, youth. Uh, and we are delighted that we're joined by the President of the European Youth Forum, uh, Karina Altengruber. Um, welcome, Karina. And just to set this conversation up, we showed you earlier the polling from Ipsos about attitudes on priorities. We're going to have a look at a slide now that shows us something about the breakdown by age groups. And I think this is quite striking that we have a, just about a majority of people saying that when the camp pan, con, uh, COVID pandemic is over, we should still be prioritizing social. But if we go to under 24s, it, the proportions are much more strongly in favor of focusing on the social. Young people seem to want something different because they know this is the world that they're inheriting. But Karina, welcome uh, to uh, the What Works conference. Glad you could be with us. Hi. Hey. Uh, hey. Thank you so much for having us today here. I'm very excited to, to be part here. Um, so as you said, my name is Karina Altengruber and I'm the president of the European Youth Forum. So we're representing more than 40 million young people directly living in, in Europe. And indeed, when, we look, when you're looking at this poll, which basically outlined that social aspect is so important for young people, I can only totally agree. And it also shows like already what was going wrong in the world now. Uh, because if we look at our economy, if we look at uh, social rights, already now young people are struggling with accessing our social rights. Already before the pandemic, um, youth unemployment rates were much higher than in comparison to other age groups. And of course, youth unemployment isn't very much related as well, like with other social rights. So for instance, when it comes to housing, 
how are you going to afford a house or how are you going to pay your rent when you do not have employment, for instance? How do you have access to healthcare as well when you're not in employment? So I think there is a lot of linkages as well, which clearly shows because of already this long lasting stance where young people were suffering from the consequences of the crisis, clearly indicates as well like this results that we are also seeing now in this poll as well that really young people are striving for is having access to social rights, is having access to healthcare, is having access to education as well to really sustain uh, a future for us young people. So you really think there is a groundswell of um, amongst the younger generation who really do think that they want their governments and the institutions of capitalism to act in a different way? Indeed. So because of, as I was mentioning, because of austerity measures that were taking in the previous crisis, young people are suffering long term consequences because of this. Because if you do not have employment, you don't pay in the pension system. This, for instance, of course, will have a long term impact in your life as well. Of course, if you do not have employment as well, or if you do not have a proper job, meaning that one job alone can sustain yourself. Right now, we see a lot of people who are asked or actually forced to take up two or three jobs in order to sustain ourselves. So there's really a big struggle here that we're seeing all over Europe, but also like all over the globe as well. And I think now with the current pandemic, we also, there's also being brought light to this inequalities or the struggles that young people are facing as well. Um, way more young people, more than 60% of young people are in temporary work contracts when we're looking at statistics from 2016, which makes us again now more vulnerable in such situation as COVID as well. So what we really need to look into is how we can protect our social rights because it's otherwise it will have long-term consequences on the lives of young people. So now when we, uh, we did uh, work with the European Commission on the social progress index for the regions of the EU, one of the most striking findings was that there was no relationship between the unemployment rate and social progress. Because unemployment can be low because people have work, but if that work's not giving them what they need to survive, it's not actually delivering much in terms of quality of life. Indeed, indeed, because what do you do if you cannot sustain your life with the job that you're having? What are you doing when you're working four to even more hours and you cannot pay your for your rent? You cannot pay your for your basic needs. You cannot access education. And then I think there's really something going wrong. That's why it's important as well that now, especially with the current situation is, is that we are confronted with, that governments are really investing in the welfare state but also investing in reforms in the welfare state as well, because right now we are having a contribution-based system, but for young people, unfortunately, this often is not working. Um, so it's really like an, we need to overcome the situation that we're currently in to really ensure that everyone in our society has access to social rights. And I think this is also something we really need to, to strive at and look into it. And Social Progress Imperative is delighted to be partnering with the European Youth Forum on the development of a Youth Progress Index. We did one a couple of years ago. We were refreshing that. And I think that's going to give us very important insight into how you can how the youth pattern of development matches against the wider to help try and inform some of those policy responses to deliver for young people. Karina, just ask uh, if you uh, if you had a message for the uh, leaders of the world gathering at the General Assembly, uh, what would that be? I think what we really need to do right now is to work together with young people and to identify common solutions. We as young people, we are rights holders. And of course, we know best what is working for us. So the key message I think will be to really engage with communities, with young people as well, and work together to identify the solutions to the current situation that we are confronted with. And I think one of the messages that I can already bring here as well is, we need to avoid that we are leaving a generation behind. We really need to work together, together governments, young people, businesses, to find a solution here in order that young people have access to social rights. It's about our well-being. It's about our future. It's about education. It's about employment. So we really need to have a holistic approach. And what we need to look at, we cannot go back to where we were in January or December last year, because already back then our system was broken and was not working. Already back then, youth unemployment was high. We already were overexploiting our planet. This is not the way we want to see. We need a different system 
where rights are being respected and where young people have full access to our social rights, where we are safeguarding our planet. So we really need to look into a holistic perspective here. Great. Karina, thank you very much. And we're looking forward to collaborating and working together. Thank you thank so you much. Um, and now, uh, from a youth perspective, one of the, uh, moving on, one of the big findings of the 2020 Social Progress Index was, I'm sad to say, um, how badly the United States was doing. Um, we actually saw the United States was the country of the 163 countries we've measured that has gone back the furthest. The United States now ranks 28th in the world on social progress. There's a terrific article covering this in the New York Times today by Nick Christoph. I just wanted to read you the last closing sentence, which is very powerful. He says, let's wake up. We are no longer the country we think we are. Well, I'm uh, pleased uh, to join us for this discussion now. Uh, we have two great experts and friends of SBI, uh, Robert Blaine from the city of Jackson, Mississippi, uh, and Carl Russo uh, from uh, the San Francisco Foundation in California. So I'd love to get your perspectives, maybe Robert first. I mean, um, Social Progress Index is telling a macro story about how the US as a whole is going, but obviously there are different stories in different places. Mississippi you know, is a place that has you know, famous issues around racial inequity. We've got the whole Black Lives Matter agenda now has really raised up the agenda and is part of the policy debate. Mississippi has also been hard hit by COVID, and I know that you'll be working managing that. I mean, how does this result? What does this tell us? I mean, Nick Christoph says we need to wake up. Is the wake up coming? Can America turn this around? What does this mean for Jackson? Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, um, our mayor says is that um, in um, economic times of boom or bust, um, Mississippi has always been on the bottom. And so one of the real challenges here is that um, in a place that has uh, such a strong history of inequality and in in inequity, um, we've, uh, as a local government here in the city of Jackson, which is actually the capital of the state of Mississippi, have tried to find mechanisms to be able to create new opportunities in spite of that tragic history. But when you look at, when you look at the city of Jackson, um, one of the big issues is that um, there has been systematic ways of containing wealth in some communities and limiting the growth of wealth in other communities. And, and that really goes back to the historical uh, practice of redlining from the, 19, from the 1930s, where um, neighborhoods were actually cordoned off as um, uninvestable. And because of that, what, we, what we've seen most recently is that um, unemployment in Jackson pre-COVID was at 4% official unemployment. That was the official numbers, of course, not um, taking into account the communities that have not been counted. But over the past six months, unemployment has grown from 4% to 14%. And out of that 14% unemployment, um, we've cited that 28% of the, of, the, of the population is what we call resilience vulnerable, meaning that they have three or more factors that mean that even when we are past this pandemic, resilience is going to be very difficult with that part of the population. So, you know, it's, it's been a real focus on how do we try to create equitable resilience in Jackson post-COVID, which really looks at three areas, education, workforce, and healthcare. And those are the three things that we've been focused on like a laser. And so um, in the education uh, realm, We've actually leveraged our high-speed municipal fiber um, to build out a um, over-the-air broadband network for every single child in our public school system so that we can guarantee that every child not only has access to a device, but they also have access to the broadband that they need in order to be able to still access opportunities for learning. Um, uh, so we'll actually complete that network by December we just started the school year and 100% um, of the district is online, um, which is causing a tremendous amount of uh, upheaval in many families because those vulnerable, that 27% of vulnerable families, those are the ones that are the frontline workers. They're the ones that have to go to work and then they've gotta be able to find a way to educate their child at home at the same time. So um, an incredible amount of challenges that we see um, in those communities. 
Um, it, when we look at workforce, we've actually created a partnership with the Aspen Institute, and we're developing an entirely new workforce ecosystem focused on being able to connect all of the workforce partners in the city and to not only create a pathway to a job, but to create a destiny at the a destination at the end so that we're truly connecting people into sustainable jobs that have a living wage. And then finally, healthcare. Um, that 27%, 28% of the population um, has historically been denied health care. They've, they've lived in neighborhoods where, um, uh, for example, the rises in high heat are exacerbating um, underlying conditions. We have people that are living in food deserts. They're living in banking deserts. All of these um, historical practices have put more pressure on communities that have been historically disadvantaged. And so we're trying to leverage um, resources that the city has in order to try and create more equitable opportunities um, for those communities. Thank you, Rob. I think that's right. I think what we're seeing in a lot of the data is that inequity is what's driving some of those poor US numbers, especially around health issues. Stay with us. I just want to bring in uh, Khan Russo now, because I think it's just as a contrast, as you said, um, Mississippi's history being at the bottom in boom and bust historically. Um, San Francisco is a boom town. Khan, from the uh, San Francisco perspective, is, are these the same issues that you're seeing? You know, we are experiencing similar um, uh, issues, Michael, but as you said, we've been in the boom town, and it's a moral disgrace that we are in the position that we are in now. And that's why I think the partnership with and the information from SPI is so critical to kind of shining a light on that. But the reality is, you know, we haven't been doing well for a long time, right? We've been in Boomtown, but the housing crisis that we have faced in the Bay Area, in San Francisco and California um, has been going on for decades now. And we just haven't had the impetus to really overcome it. And I think what is uh, a unique opportunity as kind of spoken about by other speakers is that uh, this is a way for us to kind of rebuild in a more equitable way. And we have to rebuild in a more equitable way. You know, the New York Times article that you mentioned identified that the US is number one in healthcare and number one in um, access to great uh, universities. But we you know, but the disparity between that and then access to basic education and basic healthcare is very varied. So I think that's a reality that we need to face. It, definitely it is a country of have and have nots. And I think like the COVID-19 and the protests around the country for racial justice um, really have made it clear that the need for our systems to operate better, um, especially our housing systems um, is really critical. You know, access to property and housing is, has clear implications to, general, uh, to generational wealth, to community wealth building and to safety and health. And COVID-19 has created a great urgency for us to really think, uh, rethink the importance of our homes and our neighborhoods and our environmental resources. You know, I think the pandemic has demonstrated the fragility of the current housing systems. It's fragile for tenants, right, who are struggling to socially distance and access online resources, as Robert just inferred. Um, it's fragile for landlords who are struggling to operate remotely and collect rents. You know, it's fragile um, for our economy, which needs healthy workers who have a place to be safe but still engage in everyday activities. And it's fragile for already displaced people in our streets. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I think this is the thing. COVID is a, a virus, but it's exposed so much more. And the COVID crisis is about when that virus hits, you know, fragile systems, vulnerabilities in our societies, and it's exposing a whole agenda that could be an agenda that we actually can, can address. Maybe this is a chance. I'm gonna, I, I'd love to ask an unfair question of both of you. Um, there's, a, there's going to be a new president, uh, probably after the election. Hopefully it'll be resolved quite quickly. I don't want to ask you to make a political judgment, but whoever takes over, what do you see as the priorities, the maybe three priorities, if the US is gonna turn around this social progress crisis? I know that you're not on the national political stage, it's a bit unfair, but um, from what you see, your own experience, Robert, you go first. What do you think is going to, a new president, a new administration should be doing? I think that um, priorities have to be focused on those that have been most historically left behind. 
and um, uh, often uh, one of the one of the quotes that our mayor likes to say is that um, capitalism in the United States works perfectly because it works in the exact way that it was designed. It was not designed for those that have been left behind, and so. Um, we really have to think about what equitable capitalism looks like and how do we start to invest, actively invest in communities that have been disinvested. And that is a very, very different model than what we've historically had. Great. Yeah, I, I would agree with you, Robert, you know, and I think that what I hope the new president's priority will be um, to center Black and Indigenous communities in, uh, in the work in the policy, right? The original sin of slavery is something that continues to be an, another virus for you know, Anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism really sits at the core of the experience of race in this country. And it's really the core and, and that racism, you know, then perpetuates racism against all other races. It's also the source of discrimination for immigrants and refugees for our community. So I hope that the new president will really be able to center uh, Black Indigenous communities. I think another priority is to really practice what we call transformative solidarity here at the San Francisco Foundation. You know, like we need to be able to push really beyond our personal and organizational comfort zones. Um, and it requires that people relinquish, uh, relinquish the oppressive powers um, and uh, help to build collective power, power in a really significant way. Um, so, you know, Karina mentioned this earlier, but like youth are core and key to uh, that transformative solidarity and building that power. And I think uh, related to what Robert said, you know, the new president needs to invest in an inclusive, a restorative economy. And we need to be able to move political and economic power into local communities to transform what the economy looks like in the 21st century. And our aim should be to be uh, to um, have an inclusive and restorative economy, economy that really prioritizes a just and equitable distribution of wealth and ownership, because it's that wealth and ownership that's going to allow everybody to uh, to prosper. I think this is an important issue we see in the data is, is that um, you know the United States is 28th this year; it's declined in the rankings. But the first year we did the data, the U.S. was 18th. It was still, it was already bad. Uh, there are some very deep-rooted problems. And I think what you're saying is that it's actually, to dig that out is gonna take a lot of work. These are not, there's no quick fixes here um, to address these. I want to bring out, I'm glad we've got um, Rick Van Pettigam with us uh, from Deloitte. Deloitte's a great supporter and champion of SBI. And Rick, you've been a great partner with, uh, with your public policy hat on. Maybe I can bring you in here. I'm mean, thinking about what's the role of business in driving some of these things, especially when we're talking about those kind of inequities and injustices uh, and then the sustainability agenda, bring it, reaching out to the next generation. What role can business play in accelerating social progress and progress towards the SDGs? Thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you for having me and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, well, clearly in a world of uncertainty like the one we live in today, business must help, must help uh, to address society's most uh, intractable problems. And this really requires business to go beyond the economic context to include the interplay among business behavior, financial markets, but also the long-term health and sustainability of society and planet. So today's businesses, uh, business organizations should see themselves as serving ends that go beyond financial success. And uh, therefore Deloitte advocates for every company to define its overarching purpose. Uh, what is it uh, the company is doing for society? Uh, and it has been said a couple of times, this is not just, uh, uh, who they say, uh, for, feel, for a feel good, it's uh, doing well by doing good. And uh, that's really the tipping point uh, that was uh, referred to. And our commitment, as you say, uh, Michael, uh, uh, is illustrated by our being founding partner of, of your uh, fantastic organization. Now, as we emerge uh, uh, from the COVID-19 crisis, hopefully in the next uh, uh, months uh, if, and, and maybe next weeks, we will need to consider the social progress measures that will underpin our ability to thrive in the new normal. And here, the challenge for business will be to predict the impact of COVID-19, not over the short term, but also over the long term. 
Um, so it's essential for businesses to uh, do scenario planning, uh, having a roadmap. And in that context, what we see is that uh, uh, public-private sector partnerships uh, will emerge as companies will have to step up as part of the global solution. Um, uh, companies uh, will have to shift more and faster towards stakeholder capitalism, not just uh, a shareholder capitalism. How can they best serve their customers, their shareholders, but also their employees? Uh, employees take a louder voice in this entire debate. We are still in the war for talent and our young employees, we are an organization of 300, 330,000 people, but the average age of our workforce is below 35. So for us, it's very important, like for other organizations, to listen to what our employees have to say in the debate to rebuild after the crisis. So, uh, and, and this has been touched upon uh, before, one uh, important trend that we see that leads us to be optimistic about, uh, about the future is the, is the growing importance of ECG, ESG reporting. Uh, and uh, th that, of course, um, uh, is just emerging. It's done on a voluntary basis now, but we are strongly advocating as an organization, working with the WEF, working with uh, 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 other partners, to really advocate a system of non-financial reporting, integrated reporting, not just reporting on, on financial uh, uh, parameters, but also on the non-financial, and the human capital, the environment, uh, and, and so on, uh, on, a mandatory, on, a, on a mandatory basis, on a global basis, in a very interconnected way giving comparable data on not just, again, on a voluntary basis, but on a mandatory basis, how, how businesses are doing uh, with regard to, uh, how they say, uh, helping to, to, to rebuild. So, thanks, Rick. I mean, I wanted to, there's a there's sort of about the question about the role of business and stakeholder capitalism. I mean, uh, President Alvarado had a nice phrase, I thought, about balancing solidarity and self-interest. And in a way, there was a, a comedy made about the war on talent. And that actually for a firm like Deloitte and many other businesses, actually inclusion is integral to being successful. Is that right? Of course it's right. And uh, diversity and inclusion has been very high on our talent agenda. It has been high on our firm's uh, uh, agenda for, for many years. As you know, Sharon has explained that in one of the previous sessions uh, uh, you had here. Um, we, what we have done is uh, really setting targets for ourselves, like for mainly focusing on gender uh, uh, diversity. Now, this is shifting or to include, uh, 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 how do you say, a cultural diversity. And here as well, we are in the process of setting targets for ourselves to just uh, in our whole would they say talent uh, life cycle starting from recruitment or even before recruitment as being present at campuses and we say uh, helping creating opportunities for the for the left for the people that are left behind to i mean to really uh, join schools and join uh, uh, educational uh, uh, programs to really make sure that we uh, there as well uh, uh, would they say uh, uh, contribute to, to to a more fair a more uh, equitable uh, society and of course, this depends from the one region to the other here. I, I'm, I'm living in Brussels and Belgium. This is not that high on our agenda. I'd like to say in Western Europe, it's high on the agenda in the United States. It has been very high on the agenda since many years in South Africa. Uh, in South Africa, we come uh, uh, to, uh, to, to meet our target of having 50% black ownership uh, in our partnership. There is quite a big partnership. So uh, what you uh, measure gets done. Uh, and it's really important for us to embrace this, uh, not setting the tone at the top and really drilling this down uh, into, into our organization. But uh, the message uh, has been uh, loud and clear. And uh, as an organization, we are working very hard to, what do you say, to, to, to improve ourselves in, 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 in regards uh, of having um, 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 uh, uh, more social justice, uh, so to say, in, in the way we, we drive our talent agenda. Thanks, thanks, Rick. Karina, can I just ask, I mean, uh, Rick is talking about the importance of a firm like Deloitte signaling to its young talent that it cares about these issues. And do, do, are, are young people really responding to this from corporations in when they're signaling about their ethical behavior, et cetera? Is that, is that really driving people's behavior, young people? 
I think it is, and it's coming more and more. Um, I think we see it with the climate strikes that young people are really demanding that corporates, that governments are taking action here. And of course, we're not only demanding action from governments, but also from businesses. I think they have really a striving and important role here to play. But this is, of course, only like one facet that is important for young people. But the other one is as well like inclusion. Um, we want more, you know, fairer businesses as well, where young people also can grow and strive as well, which means also like opening opportunities for young people coming from diverse backgrounds as well. And so businesses also need to do their work here. I think they can start with banning unpaid internships in their corporations as well, to ensure that also young people from lower social economic backgrounds also have the possibility to take up internships as well. So I think this is a massive in, in inequality that we are seeing still all over the globe as well. And this is really, really an unfair practice that we're seeing in different parts. So I think there's a lot that companies need to do. Also, we need to ensure that there are actually entry level jobs as well, um, because it's very hard for young people nowadays to actually have the smooth transition after finishing education to start a career in a company as well because a lot of positions are requiring immediately five years of experience. But how do you get this experience when you do not have the possibility of even taking up a first job? I'm really like wondering what are governments, what are businesses actually expecting here? So I think we need to have like here a stronger uh, shift as well to really allow young people as well like to, to join companies and to get up uh, employment experiences as well. So there is a lot to do. Um, and of course, as European Youth Forum, we are happy to support you as well and, and bring our ideas as well, like what needs to be done here. Thank you, Karina. And Khan, I mean, San Francisco is famous of how business has had a huge impact on the city, booming businesses. How do you see the relationship evolving with business around the social, the social justice, sustainability, social progress agenda? Yeah, business is critical. I mean, the systems that we were talking about, the capitalist system, is dependent upon business, right? When we talk about recovery, economic recovery in particular, it has to involve business. And I think what we're lucky is in the Bay Area, we do have a lot of really great partners and businesses who are invested in this in partnership. You know, the work of the San Francisco, uh, in particular, the partnership of the Bay's future, which I lead, um, Facebook, CZI, Genentech, Deloitte actually is a key partner for us too. We are gonna be working with Deloitte um, to, uh, as part of their greenhouse lab to really identify how we can respond to um, and support those who are on the verge of eviction. You know, we have tens of thousands of folks who are gonna be on the verge of eviction um, at no fault of theirs, right? It's not their fault they can't go to work. It's not their fault that they can't uh, pay the rent. And how do we then uh, really partner to ensure that? The other thing is we need to really think about the quality of the work also. And that's something that is critical um, to have businesses be involved and engaged in is not the quantity of work, it's the quality of the work and work that really uplifts and uh, trains people for uh, the future. Thank you, Carl. And Robert, for, for Jackson, how's the, how do you see business playing a part in the strategy for the city? Well, it's incredibly important, Michael. Um, one of the things that, that as a city government that we've tried to do is to actually uh, begin to model the behavior that we want to see out of our business community. Um, so, for example, um, in the budget that we just passed for um, the, the new fiscal year, which actually starts in October, um, we just passed free health care for every city employee in order to make sure that all of our employees mm -hmm. have equal access to high quality health care. Um, we've just um, in, uh, implemented a new green initiative where we are focusing on a green economy here in Jackson and uh, we are actually mapping out every single building in the city to see how energy efficient it is. And then we're actually building jobs around uh, retrofitting buildings for energy efficiency. And we're using that to be able to work with our business community and to get them to understand that actually green practices make them money. And so it's for us as a, as a city government, it's really about how can we model the behavior that we want to see in the rest of the business community? And then how do we have a real working relationship with them where um, those practices can be taken up and actually become part of the, the uh, ongoing uh, practices of all the businesses in the city? 
Thank you, Robert. Rick, um, the last word to you, and uh, the last word comes at a cost, which I mean, you get an unfair question, which is, we, there's so much potential here about the role a business can play, we can build these partnerships. How optimistic are you? Do you think business really can step up and be a driver around the new gener next generation of social progress, inclusion and sustainability? I really uh, do think uh, business can play that uh, driving or can become that driving force. And, uh, you know, business is, is business, frankly. And, uh, uh, you know, it, as a businessman, you only do the right things for your business uh, at the end of the day. So, but um, it is like uh, Gillian was mentioning, we are reaching that tipping point where for business to be sustainable, business has to be at the table here and has to take its fair share and, and, and the effort that are needed. So it's in our self-interest to, to play here and to play, uh, to play a, a bigger role than we were used to play uh, going forward. Thank you, Rick. Put less diplomatically, I mean, the way I might say it is if we don't make a change, we are screwed. And so we've got <laughs> no better incentive than to fix these problems. Otherwise, we are in serious trouble. Um, uh, Rick, Khan, Robert, Karina, thank you so much for joining this part of the conversation. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, thank you also, in particular, to all the partners and sponsors. You know, thank you to Deloitte, the Icelandic Prime Minister's Office, University of Iceland, Amazon Web Services, IQ Business and Catalyst 2030 for being our supporters and partners in this. And thank you most of all to all of you for joining us, being part of this conversation, being so active. Uh, have a fantastic day. Let us know what you think. We love feedback. Uh, feedback always makes the social progress index stronger. Let us know what you think. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Cheerio.